Hello, I'm Pastor Matt McEwen, the Senior Pastor of the Church of the United Brethren in Christ in Holly Hill, Florida, and I would like to publicly endorse and give my review to Rabbi Shapira's latest book called The Besorah According to COVID-19. The word Besorah means the good news. In fact, it's the same word that is used to describe the gospel. So we could say that this is the good news or the gospel according to COVID-19. Now, obviously, this is a title that can be either a little confusing or maybe a little provocative. But this book, I would say, is probably the most important book for this time that has been published. This COVID-19 pandemic has been a wake-up call from the Lord to get us to turn back to where we need to be. I think many pastors like myself would admit, if we were being honest with ourselves, we would admit that the church as an institution is not where it needs to be. Many of us hearken back romantically to the first century and wonder, why can't we go back to those early days in the book of Acts? Well, we can and we need to. Unfortunately, the church has become passive it's become a bit bloated, and unfortunately, it's also become ineffective. We have got to return to the roots that those apostles first set down. And that's why it's so important that you read, as a Christian, Rabbi Shapira's book. You see, it is the Jewish belief and theology that according to Isaiah chapter 45, God is the author of everything, even the author of this virus. He uses it, as this book teaches, just like leprosy in the Old Testament of the Bible, as a way to get his people's attention. You know, Rabbi Shapira points out in this book that social distancing was going on and quarantine was going on in those days of biblical leprosy. And the same is going on now. There had to be an inspection. The priest had to come and inspect you, inspect your home. COVID-19 
has made us look inward and inspect our lives and our homes. Unfortunately, there have even been relationships and marriages that have broken up during this time because the other distractions that we normally would have that would take our attention from these relationships are now gone. When we really are forced to examine ourselves and our relationships, we see where our true priorities are. Early in the book, Rabbi Shapira quotes Rabbi Cook, who compares the last days to an expression in Hebrew known as the footsteps of the Messiah. In other words, we it's almost like we can hear his footsteps. He is on the way. He is arriving soon. And Rabbi Cook says that in those days, those last times, which I fully believe we are living in right now, he says that in these times, many from the nations, many Gentiles will join themselves to the house of Israel. But when they do, they will have a bit of indigestion because they have been away from proper spiritual nutrition for such a long time. And unfortunately, this spiritual indigestion leads to what is known in Hebrew as chutzpah. It leads to a pride. It leads to an arrogance and an acting out against the Jewish people and our older brothers in the faith, Israel. This is encouraging to me because Rabbi Cook has seen that scripturally speaking, this must happen, that people from the nations, that Christians must rediscover the true root and foundation of their faith. We must remember that our faith is built on the faith that came before us, and that is the faith of Israel. Throughout the book, Rabbi Shapira lays out an amazing case for us returning to this root in these last days. It is apparent to me that Christianity as an institution, the way it stands now, will be destroyed. It just has to happen. We have gotten far afield of where Jesus originally wanted us to be. We see in the news almost weekly worship leaders and well-known pastors that are either not living according to the Bible or are completely turning their backs on their faith. Why does this happen? It's because their faith is shallow. It does not have a deep root system into the foundation of the Bible, which is the first five books of the Bible, known in Christianity as the law, but better explained as the Torah, a word that means teaching or instruction. We have gotten away from our root, and it has gotten us into trouble. We have become complacent. We as Christians must recommit ourselves to the foundation of our faith. As you go through the book, Rabbi Shapira will make the case for a conversion of the heart. It is not the intent of this book or Rabbi Shapira's ministry to turn Christians into Jews. However, Christians must have a conversion of the heart, a circumcision of the heart, as Paul talks about in the New Testament. Not a conversion in the flesh, but a conversion in the heart and in the spirit. Remember what Jesus himself said, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, didn't we do this in your name? Didn't we do that in your name? Didn't we even cast out demons in your name? But he will reply, depart from me, you workers of lawlessness, Torahlessness. I never knew you. In these last days, it's important for you to ask yourself a question. You might know the Lord, but does he know you? Does he know you in an intimate way? The way that the Bible says that Adam knew Eve and she gave birth, this intimate joining together, this marriage. We need to understand as Christians that in these last days, this wake-up call of COVID-19 is giving us a chance, a chance to course correct, a chance to have that conversion of the heart. 
a chance to become one new man, as it says in the New Testament, joined together with Jewish believers. Remember, we are the ones as Gentiles that are the grafted in branch, and Israel is the natural branch. I encourage everyone that is watching this, not only just Christians in general, but pastors especially, that you get this book and get it quickly. Make an investment in your spiritual life. This book is like nothing you have ever read before. It is deep, but it's written in a very readable way that you can understand. I can completely endorse it and recommend it. This is a book that you absolutely need. Many times books come on the scene that are sort of en vogue in Christianity at a certain time by well-known pastors or tele-evangelists or spiritual leaders of the world. And they make us feel good. This is a book that will cut straight to your core and make you question your motivations, make you question even the very foundation of the faith that you have. Is your faith truly rooted in scripture or is it rooted in the popular culture of modern Christianity? Thank you for listening. Please go to goodnewscovid19.net and order this book. And I would even challenge you to not just buy one copy, get another one for a friend or a loved one. If you're watching this and you have become curious about the Jewish roots of your Christian faith, why don't you consider buying it for your pastor? Buy it for a spiritual leader in your life. This is absolutely a life changing and future changing, destiny changing work. And I pray that you would have an open mind and heart to receive its message. Thank you once again. I'm Pastor Matt McEwen. God bless you and get the book.
Shalom, chavarim, en chag Chanukah Sameach. My name is Rabbi Yitzchak Shapira, and I'm so delighted that you are joining in us tonight for the seventh night of Al Anisim on the miracles. I pray and believe that you have been blessed in the first six nights. And I believe that today in the seventh night, a night that we're going to go internationally to light the Hanukkiah all the way from India, that you will be greatly blessed. If this program is touching you, touching your heart, please help us to spread the light. Simply hit like and share. If the Lord leads you to support this program, he would be happy and delighted that you partner with us as it is a joy to have you here with our family every night. As I explained to you already in the past programs, every night we recite one of the names of the Messiah. Tomorrow on the eighth night, we will actually open a rare scroll of the book of Isaiah and we will sing it over you. So I hope no matter what you do, do not miss the eighth night of Hanukkah with myself and Noah. We recite every day. And today on the seventh day, we say, Pele Yoetz, El Gibor, Avi, Ad. And we have the seventh name tonight. He called Asar. The word Sar means be a prince, to be exalted. And the Mashiach has been exalted above any other one. And that's why the Messiah I called the servant of the Lord. Did you know that Isaiah 52, 13 is often refers to the Messiah? It says, behold, my servant will prosper. He will be exalted and he will be lifted high. The Messiah indeed is called the Shamash, the servant of the Lord. And you wonder why he called exalted, highly exalted? The different Midrashim explain to us that he will be higher than Abraham, higher than Isaac, higher than Jacob, in Moses and even greater than the angels himself. On him it says, Who are you, O great mountain, who stand before Zerubbabel? I lift up my eyes to the mountains, where my help come from. The story of Hanukkah is a story that comes to teach us the importance and the significance of our identity. Today, if you are a Jew or you are a Gentile, you are coming to a new identity through his life. There is an important story that I would like to share with you before we get to the halacha of the day. The story goes like that. In that day, the wicked Antiochus sent his military leader to the temple. And it says that his military leader entered into this, to the temple. He tried to enter in and he saw inside the temple a mechitza, a wall of separation. As it is written upon it, a message of warning to those who are uncircumcised, saying, do not cross over to the other side if you have been uncircumcised. And also a warning to the Gentiles, do not come in. Now, when the military leader have seen this, he became angry. He became furious. And he said, break this mechitza. Break this wall 
13 different times in 13 different ways. And then he walked into the temple and defiled the entire temple. What is the more behind the story? What is the message of the story? And why is it that he broke the wall for 13 different times? We all know that the children of Israel has 12 tribes. Each breach in the wall represent one tribe. There are different things. There are 12 on the zodiac sign. There are 12. There are 12 hours in the days. In there are 12 hours in the night. There are 12, um, 12, 12 uh, months. In the breastplate, there were 12 stone. So forth and so forth. But why? Why is it? that it was breached 13 times. Listen to the answer who is given us by our rabbis. And I will read it first in Hebrew. And I would like you to think about this on the seventh day, the day of perfection, the day of completeness, the day of wholeness. It says, Veleze kivnu ayevanim. ביוד גימל הפריצות שעשו. לרמוז שבני יעקב במכירת יוסף אחיהם פרצו את יוד בית השבטים מחמת כך ראויים לסבול עול הגלות תחת האומות. Listen to this. Why is it breach 13 times? Because there is a secret person, a 13 brother, who is involved in this story. It is the brother who was responsible to selling Joseph. And because of that, it was also responsible for the 13th breach. You see, during this time, there are many Jews who were like the brother of Joseph. What do I mean by that? They were Hellenized Jews. There were secret spies who lived inside the Jewish community and were working with the Greek empire undercover to remove Jewish identity. Today, we have a calling, a responsibility to bring back Yosef, to bring back the wholeness and the fullness. And how do we do this? Why do we think about it on the seventh day? Because the message of Hanukkah is the message of fullness and wholeness. The Hanukkah come to remind us to be in peace with all men, protect the unity of the house, do not speak against anybody, and most importantly, make sure that your light is lit and those around you are lit. And that's why Yeshua himself said, shine your light before men that they will see your good deeds and they will praise your heavenly father who is in heaven. Let's not be like this 13th child, the one who sold his brothers down the river. Let's make sure we protect the entire house of Israel. God bless you. Chanukah Sameach. It's time for us to look for a minute or two. Devar Halacha. Let's study Halacha for the seventh day of Chanukah. Today we are going to learn a very interesting minhag, not an Halacha as pertaining to Chanukah. What is a minhag? A minhag is a tradition that we find especially according to those who come out of Sfarad. During the time of lighting the Hanukkiah, one should never be alone. The tradition of our people, specifically to those who light it together with their family, is to pray for their children. Listen to the daily minhag. Migodel ma'alat adlakat ha'neor from the 
magnitude of the event of lighting of the candle. Lishot lebanim talmidei chamim we pray for the merit of our children. Al ken, therefore, b'sha'a sh'nerot ha-chanuka dolkim, when the nerot, when the candle of Chanuka are lit, yevakesh ha-adam al banav, the man should pray for his own son. Sh'yu kulam tzadikim v'chachamim, that the world will be righteous and wise. וכן יקבץ את ילדיו, and therefore it is important to gather your children and his household during the lighting of the candle to awaken their soul. The man of the house, the father of the house, he is a representative of the Hanukkiah, of the Shamash himself. Your family is a Hanukkiah, and the spiritual head, the, the man of the house, should be the Shamash, who is lighting to the entire household. And then it's a tradition to even give to the least of them, to the youngest of them, the Shamash in their hand, and to allow him to partake in this precious mitzvah. Why is it that even the littlest one, even the littlest one, like the Hanukkiah, when the father or the husband is gathering it. Because even the littlest one can provoke the entire house, the entire Hanukkiah, it can provoke it to jealousy. And that's what is important for us to remember each and every one of us have a unique role the Jew and the Gentile, but each and every one of us can be used to light the house. And that's why it's important that a child from the age of three or four, I remember myself at a young age of three or four already lighting the Hanukkiah. And the same should be true to you. You gather people around them and give them the tools to light the house, bring the tools to the world so others will be equipped to light the Hanukkiah, the house, the body, or as Yeshua called them, the city of the hill. So in our family, every night somebody else light the Hanukkiah, everybody gets turned. And I hope that you do the same in your family. Chag Sameach to all of you. Now today we have a very special surprise for you. The worship and praise going to take place with a special guest in the studio with us. Is none other than Chomp the Shark. This is part of our special children program. I hope this will be a tremendous blessing to you, your family, loved one. This is what we're talking about today. Even the littlest one partaking in the lighting Hanukkiah. This is the way we're doing it in our house. And then we have a very special surprise for you. Check out this special and sign up your children to Shuvu Yeladim. Shuvu Yeladim, one child at a time. Shalom Yeladim, it is me, Noach, from Shuvu Yeladim. I have Rabbi Yitzchak Shapiro here with me today. And, um, well, Chomp, oh, Chomp! Do, 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 do. It's Chomp from Shuvu Yeladim, hey! Hey, Chomp! Oh, hello, it's Rabbi Shapiro, it's your Abba. Yeah. He's come to visit us today. Hey, John. Yeah, well, well, hello yeah. there. Uh, you told me it was a special occasion. Yeah. I'm not sure what today it is. we're going to celebrate Hanukkah. Hanukkah, what? Hanukkah. Uh, Rabbi, what is Hanukkah? Champ, we're going to teach you about our favorite holiday. Favorite holiday? Yeah, because you know how many gifts we get in this holiday? How many? Eight gifts. You are kidding me. Eight gifts. Oh, my goodness. We can get you a little veggie here and veggie there. Every day, different thing. Yeah. Even yeah. vegetarian shakshuka. 
vegetarian shakshuka. Well, Lovely. shakshuka is already vegetarian. Oh, that's right. <laughs> Shaks, you no know meat. what we celebrate in Hanukkah? No, I don't. What do we celebrate in Hanukkah? Have you ever heard about somebody named Judah? Judah. The well, there's somebody. Maccabee. That... Judah, though. What? The Maccabee. The Maccabee. Let me teach you. Okay. Together with no, no. Maccabee. Maccabee. Hey, Maccabee. Who? Maccabee. Yeah, and then there was this really mean king. Oh, dear. Mm -hmm. Remember, I think I told you about him? Oh, was he the one that he tried to make it illegal for the Jewish people to worship the Lord? Yeah, and they were acting like they were reading the Greek idol books, but then inside, really, they were secretly reading the Jewish stuff. They were they were being secret. Yeah, they were rebelling. Like a secret agent. Yeah, it's actually that was the good kind of rebellion, not doing what the Greeks wanted them to do, the worshiping idols. Everyone knows there's only one God. That's right. Well, you've taught me all about that. But you know what happened? What's that, Rabbi? Should um, the Maccabee said, "We are going to go and free the temple." Do you mean that, that like they were going to have a battle? A battle for the temple of God. Oh boy! You probably now. Now, guess how many soldiers Judah had? But I don't know. Just guess. A hundred thousand. No, he had like eight thousand. Eight thousand, but that's not very 1, many. One thousand. No, he had about seven thousand. Oh my goodness! And how many did the bad guys have? Oh, they have in the final battle. It was seven thousand against 50,000. What? Oh my goodness, that's crazy. Yeah, the matter of fact, there was a mean general. His name was General Gorgias. Can you can say Gorgias? Gorgias. He even sounds mean with that name, Gorgias. It no, sounds Gorgias. 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 It sounds okay. silly. Yeah, well, it does. And you know, he was sure he's going to make all the Jews slaves. Oh no, not my friend Noah. Yeah. Oh. No, a grand, grand, great, 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 great grandfather was in this battle. Oh, Love my it. goodness. That's amazing. Now, guess what happened? What's that? They went and they got into the temple and they won. They won the battle? They won, but there was a problem. Oh, dear. They needed to light the menorah. The one in the temple? Yes. Yeah. Noah told me about it. Now, what do you need to light the menorah? What do you need? Matches and well, well, I think you need uh, oil. Oil. You that's know how right. to say oil in Hebrew. You say shemen. 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 And they found only one cod. The Hebrew word cod mean oil flask. They found only one flask. But Rabbi, how are they going to light the menorah if it's got to more than one light with only one flask of oil? That's where the miracle came. Before they can produce more clean oil, they use the one flask for eight days of miracles. You are kidding me. And that's why we celebrate Hanukkah for eight, day, eight days. Because it's a miracle? Yes. Wow. And that's why we give eight gifts. And My that's why goodness. we love to eat oily food. Oily food? I like oily Lots. food, like donuts. Ever latkes? Oh, I have, that's like a potato pancake. Yes. Right? Yes, oh, delicious. We, we have a family recipe, sweet potato and jalapeno. Oh, you serious? Yeah. Mm -hmm. it's a family goodness, recipe. That's another level. Yeah, and what about falafels? Oh, I like falafel. They're vegetarian. Yeah. So, you know, Chomp, what is really awesome thing we do in Hanukkah today to remember those eight days? What is that? We love to throw parties. Can you can I see your party song? Let's go party. We're going to party. party. We're going to party. party. Oh, we're partying now. And yay, yay, yay. Oh, yeah. Thank you. Yes. Yeah. So, so we are going to throw a party, and to throw a party, we need chaverim, right? Chaverim. Let's let's call the word chaverim mean friends. The word chaver mean a friend. Let's try it together. Let's call to a chaver. 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 Call to the chaver, Noah. Huh, I wonder if anyone's gonna come. Chaver. Someone. Chaver. Someone come. Chaver. chaver. I it's gonna be a baby. Oh, oh my goodness. goodness! We found you. Who is this oh, chaver? This is, uh, Timothy. Ah, introduce he, Timothy, your chaver. I, he lives next door. Oh, hello, Timothy. I it's just, nice to meet you. This is my house. His house is where. Right here. Oh my yeah. goodness, your neighbors. Yes, yeah, your neighbors. Wow. Yeah. Well, one of the things we're going to do, we're going to light the Hanukkah, Noah. Mm -hmm. Do you know the song, The Blessing? 
Yes. Uh, so, no one taught me the blessing, Rob. I can't oh, do it as well. Say with me. Everybody can say with me. Even Timothy. Okay. Repeat after me. Baruch. Baruch. Ata. Ata. Adonai. Adonai. Asher. Asher. Kichanu. Kichanu. Be mitzvotav. Be mitzvotav. Did you get the... Vitsi Vanu. Oh, oh, well, let's start over. Let's try over. Why? Okay. Baruch Atah Adonai. Baruch Atah Adonai. Eloheinu Melech HaOlam. Eloheinu Melech HaOlam. Wow. Yeah, thank you, Noach. Asher Kitshanu. Asher Kitshanu B'mitzvot Tav. Vitsi Vanu. Vitsi Vanu. Le'adlik. Le'adlik. Ner. Ner. Shel. Shel. Chanukah. Chanukah. Let's try together. Ready? <coughs> Chomp, I would love to hear your best voice. And your best oh, dance I'm, I'm going to do yeah, my best voice. Dance. You can okay. dance. Baruch Atah Adonai Eloheinu Melech HaMolam Asher Kitshanu Bebez Otah Vinzivanu So now, after that, we're going to have something called the Chanukia. Chanukia, Chanukia that we're going to light every night. Every oh night. Dear. Yeah, every night we're going to light it. And guess what? One of my favorite things to do is to let the party begin in games with something that calls Sevivon. You play games at Hanukkah? Yes. Well, I like games. Matter of fact, before we play the game, I'll teach you a song. Oh Hold dear. it. Okay. No. Let everybody hold it. And here is a song about the Sevivon. Mm, Are you ready? Right. It's go like that. Sevivon. Can you say it with me? Sevivon. Sevivon. Sov, sov, sov. Sov, sov, sov. Chanukah. Chanukah. Hu, chag, to. Hu, chag, to. Hey. Sevivon. Sov, sov, sov. Chanukah. Hu, chag, to. Hey, Hey, We say on the Sevivon Nes Gadol Ayapo. As a matter of fact, if you can hold your Targuka straight, Noach. Yeah, down, down, down between your legs. We're going to spin it. Maybe you can give your chaver a chance to spin it. Oh, yeah, dear. That try. would be fun. Let me show you how to spin it. Well, let me tell you what everything means. Hey means you take half of the gelt. Half of the gelt. What is a gelt? I don't chocolate know. Coins. What's a... Chocolate coins. Uh-huh. My goodness. Can that sounds like it? my favorite thing in the whole world. Can you smell it? Oh, oh, that yeah, sounds yeah. lovely. Yeah. Here we go, Timothy. You can hold it Shin up. means you take. You you put back your coins. Oh dear! Uh, Shin, you lost everything. Noon means you get nothing. Nothing. And gimel means you get everything. Oh, I hope I'm oh, gonna Okay, so we're, let's try to sing the gimel song. Let's try. Here's okay. the way we do it. Chomp. Gimel, 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 and we got. Oh, gimel! Gimel! Oh my goodness, let's, my body now. Let's give a turn. Chump, okay, let ready? me see here. Let me ready? grab it with my mouth. Ready? Okay, Set. spin it. Spin it. Oh, oh there we go. There we go. Give me all time. I've got to give one as well. Wow. Hey, hey. You are, this is amazing. Give it to your chance. My I'll goodness. Help steady, buddy. Oh, dear. Oh, dear. Let's, and we got. Let's see what we got. What um, we got? 
Dimelli got it. Oh, Dimelli got it. Wow, we are on a roll. Get it? You try. I have roll. Imagined. No, no, I cannot. I cannot do it here. Oh dear. Here we go. Here we go. Dimelli. Oh, Everyone get to Dimelli. Everyone, Gmail, Gmail. It is important, oh. important for us, John, to remember that the word Gmail yes. comes from the word Gadol. Gadol. Gadol mean what? Big. Great. 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 God great. is great. Yes, he is. And every year we remember this and we celebrate the miracle that God has done to our people. Wow. Can you remember that? Yes, I can. I want to tell other people about it too, because that really is a miracle. So we are lighting the Hanukkah. Okay. We're inviting our friends. Yes. Mm -hmm. Hello, Timothy. Hello. <laughs> and then we eat a lot of good fried food. Oh my goodness. What about donuts? Donuts? What about jelly donuts? Mm. Sufganyo. 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 Oh my yeah, goodness. I they actually made word. it on a baking show that I watched. It's a baking tournament. And they, they made, made Sufganyo. Yeah. Was so it gonna, delicious? Um, I wasn't there, so I don't know how it tasted. But did it look good? Yeah, they. Oh boy. Real because one of the judges, who's I'm not gonna say his name, but he's really famous, really, really famous. <laughs> wow. Uh, I think his name. Yeah, I'm not well, gonna mention don't mention his well, name. But what, did he? But did he like it? Yeah, he's Jewish. And so he knows what it's supposed to be mm -hmm. like. So, Chomp, do you want to be invited to our Are you home? kidding? I would love to come no, to Hanukkah. No, do you want to invite all the Yeladim to come? Um, If it doesn't get too crowded, sure. That would be how wonderful. Many, how many Yeladim you can think we can fit you? 100? Maybe 100. About, maybe about 195. Oh, oh, dear. Oh, that would be wonderful. So, Chomp, we're going to teach you this song. It's a song to remind us that God is still doing miracles today. Yaladim, oh, wow. remember this, okay? okay? Let's teach all the Yaladim this song. Can you say it with me? Ala Nisim. Ala Nisim. Ve Ala Purkan. Ve Ala Purkan. Ve Ala Gvurot. Ve Ala Gvurot. Ve Ala Chuot. Ve Ala Chuot. Ve Ala Niflaot. In the past, and he's doing it today. Wow. You ready? Chag Sameach. Chag Sameach. Chomp, this is going to be your first Hanukkah. I'm so excited. You have no idea. Do you think you can celebrate it with your own family? I, th I think I know how to now. Yes, I'd love to celebrate Hanukkah with my family. And yeah. Well, you're invited to our family. Oh, well, thank you, Rabbi. And That's Chomp, wonderful. Chomp, remember how we talked about tefillin earlier? Yes, I remember. Season? Well, I have a joke. You have a joke? Okay, what is it? What... What did the cameraman use as film? To film. <laughs> film to film. That's a funny joke. I like that. Well, God. well yes, Rabbi. I think I want to try to make latkes and sufgan yot and all sorts of tasty things. But you know what the most important thing, Charles? What's the most important thing? Just to be together. Oh, Dave. that's wonderful. And to have lots of oil. Lots of oil, like because the miracle. Dave. Oil is joy. Dave. Can you say it with me? Oil, Oil is, is joy. joy. Oil, Oil is joy. joy. Oil, Oil is joy. joy. Hey. Oil, Oil is joy. joy. Yeladim, we say shalom to you. Shalom. Be joyful. Dave, Dave, Dave Kugel. 
da 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 Wasn't that a lot of fun, singing with the kids and chomp? Shuvu Yeladim is a place to be for this time for your kids. I encourage you to go to the website and check it out. Enroll your kids. We made it so economical so every kid will be able to be part of this program and learn with us every week. Talking about families, today we are going to go to the seventh night of the lighting of the candles to one of the most amazing families, the John family out of India. Did you know that Avatami Ministries have a base in India and their community is a growing, strong, wonderful community. The only Messianic community, truly Messianic in India right now. And we are blessed beyond the shadow of a doubt to have them here with us today for the lighting of the candles for the seven night all the way from India. Please, please welcome them and pray for them and rejoice in what God is doing in our virtual family and physical family all over the world. Today, seventh night, we are going to India, friends. Rejoice. Shalom and welcome to the Al Hanisib special Hanukkah program this evening. I am Pastor Joseph from Kehilat Bethlehem and Shubu, India. Along with Ahavat Ami Ministries, we are here to celebrate along with you and the whole world the seventh night of Hanukkah, a special season where we celebrate the goodness and the miracles that Hashem has done for us and for our ancestors in the past. Today, along with the rest of the world and along with India, we want to celebrate the special season of Hanukkah. We're going to begin this evening by lighting up the candle along with our brothers and sisters from this part of the world. I just want to welcome each and every one of you. And I want to say, Khag Hanukkah Samayak. Let's say the blessing together. Baruch Eloheinu Blessed are you, Lord our God, King of the universe, who has sanctified us with his commandments and commanded us to kindle the Hanukkah light. Blessed are you, Lord of God, King of the universe, who performed miracles for us and our forefathers in those days at this time. Amen. Amen. Let's uh, continue celebrating the special seventh night of Kaduka.
by singing the most powerful song during this age and bless Hashem and celebrate the goodness of the Lord. So my friends, may Hashem do miracles for you in this season, just like he did for our forefathers. May you experience the fire of Hashem and may you experience the oil, fresh oil from the throne room of God. May we be like the five, five vice virgins who had oil. And may we have the necessary preparation to do whatever it takes in this season to be prepared, to be the bride of Hashem, so that whenever he needs us, we are ready. Thank you so much for joining us. And Kax Hanukkah Samayak once again. Amen. Wasn't it awesome being today in India and lighting the Hanukkiah? What a joy and blessing to see this family growing and expanding. Visit us at avatame.org. Maybe perhaps you want to partner with this work that we are doing in India and other areas all over the world. Thank you for your support and your generosity. Yeshivat Shuvu, our educational discipleship arm, is operating in over 50 countries. You can learn more at W www.shuvu.tv to learn more about who we are and what we are doing all over the world. Tonight, this special message the, about the Hanukkah will be delivered by Pastor Joseph Jones all the way from India. Please understand that this family that we are raising and growing is a net to invite many others. It's not a club, it's not a country club. The door is open for everybody. Today we're gonna to hear from a profound teacher, one of my favorite, favorite guys to listen to when he teach is Pastor Joseph Jones. And he has a prophetic word for you this evening for the seventh night of Hanukkah. God bless you. Chag Sameach. I hope you will be so blessed by this message. Shalom. Shalom, friends. I'm Pastor Joseph. 
from Kehlad, Bethlehem, and Shuvu, India. I just want to bring greetings to you in the name of our Master, our Rabbi, Yeshua. It's such a joy this evening to join along with you and all our friends all over the world for the special celebration of Hanukkah. A couple of years back, we started our synagogue here in India. We've gone through a lot of changes. We have reached where we have reached today. And today in India, amidst so many things happening, I believe we are one of the most authentic messianic synagogues in the nation of India. For those of you who do not know India, India is a very, very vast nation. So many people, many languages. Every state has its different language, different colors, and different foods. In the midst of all this, we have a messianic fellowship, an authentic messianic synagogue over here. Yes, there are a lot of people who claim to be messianics, but in the deep root of it, they're not true. It is our mandate, it is our privilege that God has called us for times like this. We have a dream. Our dream is to see that every state in this nation will have a messianic synagogue. We want to reconnect and we want to restore back the Jewishness of the Gospels. And our mandate is to show the body of Messiah, the true Jewish Messiah, Yeshua. This evening, before we look into God's word, I invite you to stand with us in this crucial time. You can partner with us through prayer. You can partner with us through manpower. You can partner with us through technology. And you can also partner with us financially. Apart from our synagogue, and our teachings which we give week after week. We are also involved with a children's home, which consists of 50 boys and 50 girls. All of them, or most of them, are orphans and semi-orphans. During this crisis, during this whole year of 2020, it has not been an easy task. We have a mandate, we have a calling. Thomas the Apostle came to the shores of India. Romans chapter 11 talks about what it means to be engrafted back to the household of Israel. Our dream is to see that the nation of India be grafted back. Our, our dream is to see that the dream that Thomas the Apostle had for this nation to be restored back. It is our dream, it is our vision to restore back the age-old foundations, the ancient paths, so that his name would be glorified. We like, we, we envision seeing that coming to pass, that from India, there would be a highway all the way to Jerusalem. May we experience that in our days. And we are encouraging the body of Messiah all over the world. Won't you consider joining along with us standing with us and supporting us in whatever way Hashem has put in your heart so that together we will celebrate the goodness of God and see his miracles in this season. Amen. With that said, let's continue looking into God's word. This evening I want to talk about the miracle of Hanukkah. Let's begin by prayer. Barukata Adonai Elohenu Melak Haola Asher Kitshanu Be Mitzvata Vetsivanu La Sok Badevre Torah. Blessed are you, Lord our God, King and Creator of the universe, who sanctifies us with His commandments and commanded us to engross ourselves in the words of the Torah. Amen. I don't know how many people are really in tune with Hanukkah, really in tune, especially with the holiday. 
how many people in the Jewish or in the non-Jewish world are truly familiar with the holiday of Hanukkah and understand the significance of it. In the Western world, Hanukkah is perceived as some type of Jewish Christmas. That's how it is perceived by many people. In this part of the world where I come from in India, we don't know. Many people do not have any clue about what Hanukkah is all about. It is prom in the Western world, it is promoted as an eight days of gift giving. It is promoted in the secular media by secular Jews as some type of equality in relation to Christmas and Kwanzaa. Even in messianic circles, there are many people who treat Hanukkah as Christmas. For many of those, these people, they look as if it is a double holiday because they end up celebrating both. Never mind the fact that the Catholic Church is on record declaring that the 25th of December is not the birthday of Jesus. It is adopted by the church like many other holidays in order to save people, to be a witness. They, that's really never changed. The church has always done that. A carbon copy act to sort to try to get the world to come into its system. That is why when you go to cities where there are mega churches, you may see billboards and you can't tell whether you're going to a club or you're going to a church because the invitation is, try, is, is to try to win souls over. And that's something which the Catholic church started. The Pope, in fact, is on record saying that the 25th of December has nothing to do with the birth of Jesus. It has to do with trying to reach souls. Something that Judaism does not really get involved or associate itself with as in terms of assimilating. This is where we even get the term Hanukkah bush from. For, for kind of people who celebrate both the holidays. While it is none of my business on whether people celebrate Christmas or not. But this evening, I would like to let you know, since it has nothing to do with the scriptures, I would not like to associate myself with it. And I would like to do something which is more according to the scriptures. Even though Hanukkah is not written in the scriptures, it was something which the Messiah himself, our rabbi, Yeshua, he celebrated. The Gospel of John talks about he being there for the Feast of Dedication around this time. But I want to stress as a prerequisite to this message here to understand it that trying to attach Hanukkah to Christmas exposes a person's ignorance about what Hanukkah really is. In other words, People don't know what Hanukkah represents. They don't know what they are doing. That's the core of this holiday. The core of Hanukkah, the main thrust hold of Hanukkah is about fighting assimilation. Taking a spiritual holiday and putting it under the proverbial Christmas tree of another religious holiday that is rooted in materialism it defies what Hanukkah is all about. Friends, Hanukkah is not about presents. It's not about stuffing your mouth with all the sweets you have and later find out from the doctor that you have diabetes. It's not about the latkes, which may cause you to go to the washroom for the rest of the night. And definitely it is not about being promoted in the secular media in order to find some equality between Christmas and Kwanzaa. That's not the purpose of Hanukkah. Hanukkah, my friends, is about fighting the forces of darkness that try to cause the Jewish people to assimilate. Assimilate how? To forget the Torah. That's the whole reason. You must have heard exactly what the Jews, what the Greeks tried to do to the Jews crucifying their mothers on crosses if they found them circumcising their sons. 
and taking the baby and wrapping them around the neck of the mother to hang to death. That's what they did. The Greeks did some hard atrocities to the Jews. If they found you practicing Torah, you were a dead man. They would tear your body into half. Messianics who treat Hanukkah in the way of assimilating it in with, with the Christmas tradition of Chris, uh, Christian uh, tradition of Christmas are sending out a message that they support assimilation. The token Jew of many so-called messianic ministries who shun the observance of Torah for doctrines of the church are a poster child for modern day Hellenism. I know it sounds harsh, but that's the truth. Let me say that again. The token Jews of messianic ministries who shun the observance of Torah and deny the validity of the commandments for doctrines of the church are poster child for modern day Hellenism. That is exactly why many Jews died in the time of the Hashmonians, the Maccabees. When Greek had full control over Israel, she imposed her ways of living, her ideologies, her philosophies, and everything upon the Jewish people. This triggered many Jews to eventually take off the yoke of heaven. You might ask, what is the yoke of heaven? The yoke of heaven is nothing but the Torah in order to assimilate, to live like the non-Jews. In the book of Maccabees and even in Josephus' account of history, there were a large number of Jews who rejected the Torah and, and they went to Antiochus, one of the Greek generals that held reign over Israel and Egypt at that time, begging to be a Greek, begging. So much that they tried to even reverse their circumcision on their main male member and end up, which ended up mutilating themselves. This caused so much of bloodshed in Jewish history at that time. Messianics failed to see that when they assimilate Hanukkah with the secularization of Christmas, they're basically casting off the Torah. They're killing other souls, of course, not physically, but spiritually, they're killing other souls. When a soul becomes burdened with materialism, which everyone in the season is all about, all the sales and Black Friday, everyone is so infilled with materialism. And when that happens, the soul becomes weak. It's blackened out with the wants of the flesh. So instead of reflecting the light of Hanukkah, it is suffering in the darkness of Christmas. The name Hanukkah comes from the word Kanak, which means to pray. It also means dedication. And it means to dedicate in the sense of training. And it is from where, it is from here where we get the word Kinu, which means education from. This is why a person who is dedicated to God they are kanak, they are dedicated, they are trained, kinu, educated in his Torah. They are educated, they are, they are very educated in the word and they are not going to budge for assimilation. The reason why the story of Hanukkah is so miraculous is for two reasons. One, the miracle of the shaman, the oil that was found in the temple. And number two, the second one is the military victory of the Hashmonians, the Maccabees. It was the Maccabees, a small legion of men. Some accounts even say it was only 12 of them who refused to assimilate, to become some type of Gentile. They wanted to remain a Jew. They refused to assimilate. They defied the forces of darkness. And they told Antiochus that they would put an end to his kingdom. In the same manner, when you contemplate upon the miracle of the story, you understand that when you truly dedicate yourself to God in the same manner as the Maccabees, then you yourself are a Maccabee. You might ask, how is that possible? How can a person be a Maccabee if the Maccabees lived over 2000 years ago? 
Do you know what the name Maccabees means? It is an acronym for Mika Moka Ba'alim Adonai. Who is like you, Hashem? That's what Maccabees means. It's an acronym. acronym. So when the Maccabees stood up with the question, Mika Moka, they don't deserve an answer. Why? There's no answer. The reason why is because the answer is Enkamoka. There is no one like Hashem. In other words, we don't care what a person's subjective answer might be. The objective truth is that God and the Torah is the truth. The rest of the world can do whatever they want to do, but we are not going to give up on God or the God of the Bible, the God of Abraham, Isaac, of Jacob, and we are not going to give up on the Torah. That's what the Maccabees did. That's why it is very important not to assimilate and get caught up with all the stuff of materialism, especially during the season. I think when, especially when sometimes when God allows Hanukkah to fall right around the Christmas season. I believe he does it to test people. I pray that in this season, we will not get lost in the whole grab of materialism. And we will choose the God of Israel. We will choose to follow the paths of our ancestors. And we will choose to follow the path of Maccabees. And we ourselves will be a Maccabee and not assimilate and do what the nations do. So that we would be a set apart generation. A people who are sold out to God. A people who are focusing on God no matter what. No matter what the situation is or no matter what our circumstances. But we will follow God no matter what. So there are so many questions we can talk about concerning Hanukkah. We can talk about the origins of Hanukkah, the mystery of the miracle that happened, but we don't have time for all of that this evening. Let me ask you another question. Why is Hanukkah a two-part miracle? In other words, one miracle is the military victory of a small remnant of Jews who told the empire of Greece to go fly a kite and get out of town. They defeated them. And the second miracle was the discovery of the pure oil that lasted for eight nights. It's very strange that when you start thinking about this miracle and uh, how it was performed, especially when you compare this holiday of Hanukkah with other holidays in the scriptures, for example, in Pesach, we remember Pesach for one thing. What is that? The redemption from Egypt. That was one miracle that happened. How about Sukkot? We remember the restoration of the presence of God, the Shekinah, the divine glory of God that were restored back to the people of Israel. For Shavuot, what do we remember? We remember the giving of the Torah. God descending upon Mount Sinai. That's one event. And for the matter of fact, even for Purim, the salvation of the Jewish people under Esther, that's one event. But for Hanukkah, we remember Hanukkah because of a military victory against the Greeks and the discovery of oil. There is no such holiday like that anywhere in the Bible. So what's so strange about this holiday is that it begs the question, that has to be asked. Miracle oil? Really? Who cares about miracle oil? So what about miracle oil? There were countless of miracles that happened during the temple while the temple stood. So why should we celebrate eight days because of some oil? You have to understand where I'm coming from when I'm thinking about this over here. The sages teach that there were so many miracles that happened in the temple. They, and if they would have had to write it down, all the books of the world would not be able to contain it. For example, the daily three times 
a day and additional offerings. There was so much of meat that was slaughtered, left, right, and center at the altar according to kosher standards. It wasn't a single fly in the temple. Not a single fly. That's amazing. Imagine all the meat that has been sacrificed with all the blood all over the floor, especially in the middle, middle eastern heat of Israel. Surely there, there would be some flies in that location. It's like, Izzy, don't go to the garbage dump. Come over here to the Beit HaMikdash. There is fresh, fresh blood for everyone. Come on here. You could even make the movie Lord of the Flies over there actually. But one of the miracles of the temple was there was no flies. Miracle. The sages also state that during the Shalosh Regalim, the three pilgrimage feasts, that when thousands upon thousands upon thousands of Jews would descend uh, on the temple, temple, holy temple, there happened to be miraculous room for everyone to stand. I once remember being in Israel during Shavuot. Those of you who have been to Israel, you will know, especially during all these special festivals. If you go during uh, Shavuot or any of these special festivals to Israel, especially when you get on that day of celebration to the Western Wall, you will see so many people. And you'll wonder, maybe somebody will get hurt. But nobody gets hurt. It's not like the temples we go over here in this part of the world. In the Hindu temples, there is stampede, many people die, all that kind of stuff. But here, they're all standing together. There is lots of room. And as if, when we look from afar, it looks as if there is no room. But when you get there, there's room. There's no crowding. There's no fighting. They're not pushing. They're not stopping. There's nobody saying, get out of the way. There is no one yelling at each other. There is room for everyone. Imagine the temple exceeded the maximum capacity. And they were also playing with fire. In our days and times, we would have the fire department cancel our license maybe. But they were lighting up the altar. But nothing at all. There was no problem at all. The miracle was that everyone had enough room. Nobody died. Nobody had injuries. Nothing. There was enough room for anyone who wanted to come to the temple to celebrate during this festival. This explains why when Yeshua was in the temple, they went to grab him a couple of times and he just disappeared. I mean, with so many bodies around, you might think it'd be easy to reach out to him, but they were not able to. It's also said by the sages about concerning the bread of the presence, the lecampanim. <laughs> I mean, on the, on the table of shoe bread, the sages said it was made and after it was made, a week later, the bread in, on the table of shoe bread was still warm and fresh a week later. No, oh, friends, they didn't have a burner. They didn't have a glass stove uh, back then. There was no electricity. It basically stayed fresh and warm even after a week. So imagine, you didn't, you, you, you didn't have to make fresh challah. Every era of Shabbat, they had fresh challah every week. Not only that, they would say that when the pregnant woman would come into the temple with all the smell of the meat, none of them went into miscarriage. Anyone who knows when, uh, when a woman is in her final stage of labor, if she doesn't get something the way she wants it, it may cause her to have miscarriage. Here, the woman would not have any type of miscarriage in the temple. Nothing at all. A miracle. So there's all these miracles. There is fresh bread for a week that is that's unheard of, friends. I keep my hala in three, four days. My hala begins to rot. This is in the temple. And in the Middle Eastern heat, I mean, it's, it's still warm. It's still fresh. I mean, if you go to the market, if you have ever been to the market, uh, in, especially in Jerusalem, you will see some people selling maybe two-week-old bagels 
And what do they say? Fresh, fresh, fresh. But he's got flies on it too. All these miracles plus many more, never mind the miracles Yeshua performed in the temple. But there is not a holiday for any of these miracles. There is no holiday for the military victory day. Everybody come, let's come together at Ahavat Ami or let's come together at Shivu India because next month we're going to celebrate a time when the Hashmonians and before that King David's forces went. There's no such thing like that. There's no such thing as fresh meat day holiday. Meaning what? Imagine you went to the shul and you see everyone with meat and you're smelling meat. What, what are you smelling? What, what is the smell of meat for? Well, because during those days and when the temple stood, the women came in and they smelled the weed, meat and they didn't have a miscarriage. So we're just celebrating the fresh meat day holiday. There was, there's no holiday like that. Or when you come the next day, there is this big gathering in this, in the shul and the place is packed all over the place. What's everybody doing here? You know, way back in the temple times when everyone came in, we made a celebration called the enough room day celebration holiday. There's no such days to celebrate. These days as holidays. Or what about the leprosy healing day? Get all the lepers in here. Nothing. There is no such thing. But yet there were so many miracles performed. So why does Hanukkah get a special holiday for two miracles that were nothing but a drop in the ocean of miracles when the temple stood? Good question. Maybe the miracle is rooted in something that came out of impurity. Something pure came out from something impure. Maybe that's the root of it. Because legally, halakhalically speaking, according to the Torah, the Torah teaches that if the temple is filled with dead bodies, in this case, when Greece came in, Antiochus slaughtered countless number of Jews in the temple, in the Holy of Holies, that if there were that many number of dead bodies, and all of the holy vessels, including the oil, was basically rendered tame, impure. They were no good. In this case, the, the Hashmonians, the Maccabees, we learned they, that it took them eight days to basically clean the temple, the Beit HaMikdash, of its ritual impurity. Now, there's something interesting I found out about Jewish law many people don't know about. Not that I'm an expert of it. I just learned about it. Unless you're in the orthodox realm. There is a halakha which says when the majority of the priests or the kohanim and the people are impure, you can use impure objects to do your service for God. Such as oil if it is impure. It's permissible because the majority of the people are impure and in order to do the service you have to do it. So it's, it's, it's permissible. This is also why I want to touch, uh, you know, understand why Yeshua was able to do what he did with the impure people because majority of the people in his time were impure in his day also. He sat with sinners when most of the people didn't want to sit with them. Because what did Yeshua do? He basically took this concept that when everything is impure, you can use impure objects in your service for Hashem. The Hashmonians... But the interesting thing about this fact is that the Hasmonees, the Maccabees, they didn't settle for this halakha or this law or this concept at all. Everyone is this uh, defiled. This is defiled. That is this, uh, defiled. Everything is defiled. Instead, the story goes on to say concerning the Maccabees that they insisted on looking for pure oil. Everything was everywhere. This is crazy. The logical evidence is that there was nothing here. You got you got to clean blood, bleach this, and maybe they have sacrificed pigs on the altar in the Holy of Holies. All types of unclean things they did there. And there you're looking for the miracle oil. It doesn't matter. The Torah says it doesn't matter if you're wrapped in, 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 in if you, if you, even if you're wrapped it in properly, it is still impure. This is what the Torah says. It seems crazy for them to say that we still are going to search for pure oil. 
Anyone who knows the Torah knows that by trying to look for pure oil, when the situation is like this, knows that it is an illogical endeavor. It's pointless. Let's just forget about it. The Torah teaches that anything within the proximity of a dead corpse is automatically impure, tame. No matter how many pure flax or fl fl uh, flask of oil there were, the first dead corpse issues the act of tame impurity. Therefore, it doesn't matter, all oil will be impure. Now, this concept, if you don't know, is derived from Pasha Mitzorah in Leviticus chapter 14 and 15. The Torah teaches that even if a person with zararat, the leprosy form disease, did not physically touch certain objects in their home, those objects are automatically rendered impure simply because they are in the proximity of the person with the disease. They don't have to touch it. Automatically take the pottery and everything, take the dishes, basically destroy them. That's what the Torah says. So for Maccabees, it would be a vain attempt to search for pure oil. The best they could do was to use that which was impure oil since the halakha would also allow it in their favor. But do you know what they said? They said, no, that's not enough. We don't want impure oil. They said, we want pure oil. We want pure oil. What do we learn from this, friends? From this scenario, we learn a very, very powerful lesson about this holiday. In times of uncertainty, such as Purim, when the Jews, when the Jewish people were faced with genocide, and Hanukkah, when the Jews were faced with religious persecution, the Jewish people had two options. What were the two options? One, they could run and bear arms to prepare for war, or two, they could run to God in Shuva, in repentance, and cry out for help. Which one is the best option? Run and bear arms and prepare to war, or run to God in repentance and cry out for God's help? Some might say two, some might say one, maybe some others might say both. Some would say neither, just run for the hills. We, we have two holidays that are similar to each other in relation. What are they? Purim and Hanukkah. And by each one of these kagin, these celebrations, we find different reactions when facing the same situation. For example, the book of Maccabees and Josephus tells us that the Jews were being oppressed by the dark forces of Greece. G the Greeks tried to abolish the Torah. They killed any Jew found practicing the Torah. If you practice circumcision, like I said, they hung the mother on the cross and they wrapped the child around her neck. If you were found eating kosher food, they would cut your tongue off. They found you studying Torah. They would rip off your eyes. This is where the dreidel game basically comes from. They had to use a childlike game to fool the Greeks that they were not studying the Torah. The word dreidel is a Yiddish word meaning to turn and is a spinning top with the Hebrew letter on each of its four sides. The four letters, the first one is a nun, a gimel, a hay, and a shin form an acronym for the words Nes Gadol Hayasham. A great miracle happened here. These four letters have a, the numerical or the gematria value of the word Mashiach. The oppression of Greece was a spiritual oppression. The Greeks didn't say, we want to destroy you as a people. They said, just give up your belief in God. This God that you believe in, just give up. Give up the Torah, the Shabbat thing, 
you we find you worshiping on shabbat we will do something to you you to you too if you are found worshiping god on shabbat we will do something to you they did all types of things anything that had to do with the torah they were spiritually oppressed what was the reaction of the jews to the spiritual oppression did they run to god crying out did they start fasting did they start crying out in repentance in shuva no friends history tells us the hashmonians or the maccabees went to war and they went to war and they defeated the greeks and the reign of antiochus but then in the book of esther we learn that the jews are being oppressed by the dark forces of persia the persians under the wicked haman attempted to physically destroy the jews through genocide haman said i don't care what you believe i just want you dead i don't like jews period i want you dead he said you come over here you can be a muslim you can be a christian i don't care i will still kill you he doesn't care since the jews were being faced with physical oppression but does the scripture say esther called all the jews and said get your tanks and guns ready we are going to war no what does the scripture says instead the scripture says that she called all the jews to run to god and fast and make shuva and repent so friends we have two different scenarios facing the same situation what is it oppression we are facing a similar situation there are two different reactions in the case of hanukkah the hashmonians or the maccabees the jews were faced with spiritual oppression and instead of fighting back spiritually they fought back physically in the case of purim the jews were faced with physical oppression and instead of fighting back physically what did they do they fought back spiritually why is this backward type of thinking here because purim was about physical oppression we celebrate it in a physical way how is that lots of eating people like drinking like dressing up like a bunch of clowns it's about physical pleasure it's about joy and because hanukkah is about spiritual oppression we celebrate it spiritually that is why the halal from sukkot is added for the prayers during hanukkah every day of hanukkah we recite the complete halal in the course of the morning prayers the halal is a for those of you who don't know is a sequence of praise and gratitude themed psalms psalms 113 113 to psalms 118 that is recited on this jewish holiday so the question is why on hanukkah did god allow the greeks to oppress israel spiritually and why on purim did god allow the persians to oppress israel physically let's ask the question god is the cause of all things in the universe right why did god allow the greeks to oppress israel spiritually during hanukkah and why did he allow the persians to oppress, oppress israel physically during purim regarding purim because the jews sinned with their bodies which got them in exile in the first place physical pleasure from idolatry sexual immorality and murder god therefore allowed an oppressor to arise and stir the jewish people to make atonement for their physical pleasures this is the reason why they refrained from physical pleasure and they fasted without food and water for 3 days they had to deny their flesh so what about hanukkah kazal teaches that because the kohanim the priests were lazy lazy yes you heard it 
The priests, the Kohenim, basically became lazy. They had no joy in serving God in the holy temple. God judged them with a concept which we call in Hebrew, Mida Kenegeb Mida, measure for measure. God says, you want to be lazy? Okay, I don't have to ask you a thousand times. I'm not your mother asking you to do the dishes. I, I, I will take care of you. How does he take care? Mida Kenegeb Mida. Measure for measure, God judged them. While the priests may have been doing their work in the temple, they might have done their job out of duty, but they had a very poor spirit. They did it with no joy. Be basically, be because why did they do it without joy? Basically because the Kohenim were basically became ungrateful. The priests became ungrateful. Someone who does not express thanks before someone. They did their avoda. They did their service with no joy. So God said, okay, I'm going to allow the Greek empire to arise and attack the Jewish people at the center of their spiritual existence and let them desecrate the very temple you serve me in. You better listen to this, friends. If you wonder sometimes when you have... You get attacks in your life. God judges us. Mida can get mida. Measure for measure. This is a system of judgment in this world. So when the sages were saying that the priests were lazy, go to the Tanakh, especially in the book of Malachi. Malachi tells us that Hashem warned the Kohanim in advance. That if they did not make Shua, if they did not repent, he would turn their blessing into a curse. And their service of the temple, which represents a state of purity, Tahor, will make them tame or impure. You can read about this in Malachi chapter 1, 6 through 10, and Malachi chapter 2, 7 through 9. The, who are these people? These were the priests. These are the priests that basically taught the Torah. These are the ones that the people looked up to when they went for maybe Torah study or when they went to learn a lesson on morality or ethics or Musa. The, it was the priests. These were the ones basically who were offering the sacrifices unto God. These were the leaders of the nation. In the New Testament, in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9, it says that you are a royal priesthood. We are called priests in the Mashiach. How are we in our service, in our avoda unto God? I find people more consumed many of times in their workplaces. They're willing to be slaves or servants unto their earthly pharaohs. But when it comes to their service to Hashem, I don't have time. I can't. When it comes to their service through giving, oh, I have too little. But when there is something I desire, some materialism that I want for my hope, all of a sudden, the resources come out from nowhere. Friends, just like Hashem judged the priest during those days, in the New Testament, it's very clear. If you and I are called priests unto God, I don't think he's going to spare us for our laziness, for our casual way of living, for our low life attitude towards the things of God and towards the kingdom of God and to pursue away from righteousness. So God says, okay, that's how you want to respond to me? You want to respond to me with a low spirit? You want to respond to me in laziness? You want to respond to me in a casual attitude? You want to respond to me with your bareness in your giving? God says, okay, watch what happens. Mida can neget mida. Measure for measure. This is exactly what happened when the Greeks desecrated the temple. They made everything impure. Everything. Hashem simply told the Kohenim, I do not play these games. You don't want to serve me? You know how it is like. For those of us who are parents, do the dishes, take the garbage. You tell them many times. 
And depend, depending on what type of parent you are, maybe you whack them on their head or throw the garbage on them. I don't know. The book of Revelation, chapter 3, verse 15. It says, I know your deeds, that you're neither cold nor hot. Oh, that you would either be cold or hot. Hashem makes it very clear. I know your deeds. I know what you're doing. You're not doing it out of the right attitude. You are having this lukewarmness in your service unto God. You say, I'm serving you. You say that I've accepted the Mashiach. But your lifestyle, your thought pattern, your way of living has nothing to do with the Mashiach. And Hashem says, I'm seeing your actions. I'm seeing your deeds. But God says, okay, I don't need you to do me any favors. You don't want to serve me? Then it's fine. I'm closing up shop. And that's exactly what Hashem did to the temple. What do we learn from this, friends? From here we learn that because the transgression was spiritual, the punishment was spiritual. The question we need to ask is, how does one make shuva? How does one repent for spiritual transgression? If the priests were punished because of their laziness, then how can they make a tikkun? How can they make a rectification for their laziness? There's only one correct way, friends. There is only one way to make that rectification. You must be willing to show God that you're willing to give up your life in order to gain that which was lost. How do I show, how do I show that I have made the rectification? I should be willing to show God that I'm willing to give up my life in order to gain that which I have lost. John chapter 12. Was 24 to 26. See what it says. John 12, 24 to 26. It says, Amen, Amen, I, I tell you. Unless a grain of wheat falls to the earth and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it produces much fruit. He who loves his life will lose it. And the one who hates his life in this world will keep it forever. Verse 26. If any man serves me, what did, what did the master say? He must follow me. And where I am, there also will my servant be. If anyone serves me, the father will honor him. Friends, are you willing to lay your life down for the sake of the master? For the sake of of the kingdom and Yeshua says very clearly that if you serve him like that not your boss not your government not your resources it is Hashem who honors us Matthew chapter 16 24 through 27 Matthew 16 24 through 27 then Yeshua said to his disciples if anyone wants to follow after me. What did he say? He must deny himself. Say no to himself. Take up his cross and follow me. Verse 25. For whoever wants to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. For what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world? but forfeits his soul? Or what will a man give in exchange for his soul? For the Son of Man is about to come in the glory of his Father with his angels, and then he will repay everyone according to his deeds. Very important, friends. He's going to, re he's going to repay us not according to what we say with our mouth, He's going to repay us not according to what we think we want to do. He's 
going to repay us not according to what we desire we like to do. But he says that he's going to repay us according to the deeds. What is your deeds? What is your action? How are you showing that you have faith? You're saying you have faith. Where is the action of your faith? If you have faith, you should have action. You should be willing to do whatever it takes to serve the king, even if you're, serve, if, even if you're working in, 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 in a secular company. The working of your secular company is only for one purpose. For what? To build the kingdom of God. You need to be able to dream about building the kingdom. In my workplace, am I able to build the kingdom? In my, in my office, in my business, among my friends, among my people, am I able to bring the kingdom? It's not about assimilation. It's not, it's not, it's, it's not about promotion. It's not about education. It's about wherever I am, I want to build the kingdom. Judah Maccabee said, no matter what, we want to find the pure oil. In a time when there was no pure oil, in the time where everything was desecrated, the Maccabees said, you know what, no matter what we will find, we will not stop looking until we find the pure oil. Just like the priests in the book of Malachi, they became lazy. And God said, okay, you want to be lazy? So according to, you, what, according to your actions, according to your deeds, I'm going to do unto you. We're talking here about the priests. The priests, they were not military soldiers. Just think about the Jews coming back to the land in 1948 from, the, from kibbutz, from maybe Poland and places like that. They were, to, they, 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 were they even fit to fight the Arabs when they came into the land? How much more concerning the Kohenim? Do you think they, they were taking some kind of martial arts? These were priests, not your average Jew that was trained in the military. Their, their day-to-day life was being teachers of the world. But yet, the only way to correct their blemish of their sin was to prove to God that they're willing to give up their life to restore that which they lost. So how does one do that is the question. How does one gain back that which they lost through a spiritual transgression? You go to war. That's how you do it. You, 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 you war against your very nature. You must fight back to gain what you have lost. And when you prove to God that you're willing to sacrifice your life in order to make sure God will perform un believable miracles just for you when he sees that your ability he sees your desire to do whatever it takes to sacrifice your life when you do that when he sees your heart condition and you're doing it whatever it takes to 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 to, to basically sacrifice your life and serve the king no matter what you will begin to see unbelievable miracles what does Shaul say, friends? Romans chapter 12, 1, 2, he says, you become a korban kai. You become a living sacrifice. Unbelievable miracles God will perform. The troubling thing with free will is that while God does not impose himself upon us, the moment he sees us wanting to go in a direction we want to go, you know what he does? He says, let me help you go there, son and daughter. Let me take you there. You want to go in a direction which you desire to go? That's fine. I will take you. Come on. Watch. This is th this God of ours. He's a very tricky guy, friends. He aids us where we want to go, whether for good or whether for bad. He helps us where we want to go, whether for good or for bad. In the case of the Kohenim, they felt that they were serving, their, 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 that, that their serving God was a burden. Hashem says, oh, serving me is a burden? Okay, that's why Malachi says, when, when you, are, you, you are going to slack off on the, sac on the sacrifice altar, why don't you throw the meat or, 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 that you throw this meat on the altar? You're slacking on your service unto Hashem. 
Why don't you throw that meat which you're throwing on my altar to, the, to your governor and see what he says? You are the same teacher that the people come to seek the lips of knowledge of truth of the Torah from your lips. And you're going to have a problem. You're, you're, you're going to covet. You're going to complain. You're going to grumble. God says, you know what? I'll give you something to covet about. The priest said, no, I don't, I don't want to serve God. This is a burden. Serving God is a burden. Oh, why me? God says, this is a burden? Let me help you find a solution. Let me bring my boys, the Greeks. See, friends, this teaches us a powerful lesson. If we don't value something, if we don't value something, guess what? It cannot benefit us, even God himself. In the book of Kings, 1 Kings 1.1, 1, 1. in the book of 1 Kings 1.1, 1, 1, this verse tells us that King David was advanced in years and he could not keep warm. And so in, a, in, in an attempt for helping the king, the servants covered him with special blankets or special garments. And surprisingly, that also didn't work. This garment should have kept him warm. Scientific law teaches us that when a person's body is cold, it needs to be warm to a certain temperature in order to remove the cold effect. So what happened to King David that these special garments didn't work? Well, since he was in his old age and he was coming to the close of his life, there was nothing in this world that could benefit him. So the reason why these special garments could not keep him warm was because he did not value them. Didn't value them. And because he didn't value them, it didn't work. When you don't value something, it cannot benefit you at all. If serving God is a trouble, if serving God is a hassle, and serving God is causing you to, to complain, to covet, and look into life as so hopeless and bleak, it means that God is of no value to you. Nothing. You might as well say that you are an atheist. God forbid. The same principle can be applied to your marriages. The same principle can be applied to your families. The same principle can be applied to your business relationships. You don't value your spouse. Your spouse is of no benefit to you. You don't value your kids. They have no, they, you, they, you are of no, they are of no benefit to you. The same principle applies. God leads us where we want to go because he doesn't force his will upon us. Since the priest, since the Kohanim slacked off, God said, okay, I'm going to make sure the very place that makes you pure is going to be the very place that is impure. I want to share a midrash of the alcoholic, shikar. Shikar is a Yiddish word for alcoholic. So I'm going to share a Jewish alcoholic anonymous here. It's a very powerful lesson from this midrash. In this midrash, there was this guy that was an alcoholic. And this guy loved booze. He loved liquor. He had all types of of posters of different kinds of brands and types in his man cave. So he loved liquor so much that he started to sell everything in his house to get alcohol. One day he sells the dining table. The next day he sold the couch. The next day he sold the, the cat uh, with the litter box for free. Eventually, the alcoholic's wife let him. She couldn't take it. He's selling everything in the house. She worked hard for those things. And he was selling everything for liquor. He even tried to sell 
I don't know, maybe his mother-in-law. But he, it didn't work out with the cops. So afterwards, the alcoholic son decided to teach him a harsh lesson. He said, if dad continues this path, he, he will even spend all of my inheritance money. So the son decided to get his alcoholic father so drunk that he passed off. Out cold in an alcoholic induced coma. So what the son did was that he dug a six foot uh, grave and he lo lowered his father's body there and threw a little bit of dirt, not enough to suffocate him just at the bottom of his feet. And he figured when, that, when, my, when his dad wakes up that this will really teach him a lesson for what he's doing and he needs to see the consequences of his action of his life. So this guy was knocked out for three days. He was, an al he was in an alcoholic coma. Coming to the close of the third day when he was about to wake up, there was a caravan of wine merchants traveling through the land. And all of a sudden, they find out that there is this, un, there is this oncoming robbers who's going to steal their merchandise and everything. So they get scared and their carriage tips over. And guess what happens to the liquor? It falls over the grave. Falls into the grave, falls into the cavern. So the liquor is all over the grave. Dozens and dozens of bottles of liquor everywhere. Couple of minutes later, the drunkard starts to wake up from his drunken state and he notices the bottle of alcohol on his head, alcohol at his feet. Because as soon as he wakes up, he sees the grave and he's thinking, oh my God. And then he says, sees liquor all over him. And with a grin on his face, he says, Gan Eden is a good place. Heaven is being good to me. This is good. The story doesn't end there though. Shortly after the alcoholic son came by to check on the father's grave, he figured dad is maybe begging him to get him out of, out of here. He's maybe thinking that dad is going to say, I'm, I'm willing to change my life, to maybe go to an alcoholic meeting to get rehabilitated. Upon coming up to the graveside, the son notices liquor bottles all over the grave. And he sees his dad drinking away as if it is a pacifier. And the son says, I don't get it. How is it, how, how is it this guy is able to get liquor even in the grave? So the son said, just forget it. Just keep buying him liquor. That's the moral of the story. That that's where the story ends in the Midrash. The question is, what is the principle that the story is trying to teach? The Midrash is trying to teach us a principle that God will lead a person in the path they desire to go. No matter if it is for good or for bad. The, the Midrash demonstrates the truth with the story of the alcoholic. God was willing to perform a miracle of supplying the alcoholic with more liquor. What does this teach? That God wants to make you an alcoholic? No, absolutely not. That's not what this teaches. This teaches us that if God is able to perform a miracle for an alcoholic who desired to drink more liquor, then how much more can he perform a miracle for those who desire to serve him with their whole heart? This is very profound. In the Gospel of Matthew, it is recorded that there were these two blind men walking around in darkness and they hear about this Rebbe named Yeshua. They hear all these great things about him and they find out that he's coming down their street. And their desire, and they had a desire to be healed. And what did they do? yell out? And they began to say, be gracious to us, son of David. Be gracious to us, son of David. 
they heard and they knew that the master was coming and they had a desire to be healed and because they had a desire to be healed the bible says the scriptures tell us that they began to yell out the people began to tell them to hush hush don't make too much of noise the more the people tried to hush them the more their desire began to grow the more their desire began to grow the more they began to yell out unto Hashem and they say and they begin to cry out and say be merciful be gracious to us son of David be gracious to us son of David and the scripture says something very beautiful friends what is it when Yeshua heard them he said he, he asked them do you believe that it is in my hand to do this you believe it is in my hand to heal you what did they say we find this in Matthew chapter 9 27 through 29 what did they say they say yes master and upon seeing that they desired Messiah to, 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 to be healed by him, Yeshua, what did Yeshua say in verse number 29? He says, he goes on to say, may it be according to your faith and, they, and the way you want to go. Amazing. According to your faith, let it be done for you. God will lead a person in the path of their faith on the path they desire to go. In the Song of Solomon, there is a midrash to the Song of Solomon. God says to Israel, my son, open for me the small opening in the size of the needle and I will push through its palaces. I will enlarge it. If it is God who does miracles for us, we just have to give him the opportunity to do it. He is the one who can change nature. He is the one who is able to alter the events of everybody's life in order to help you. If you desire to go on the path of God, he will make the impossible possible. So the question this evening is, what does this teach us about the miracle of Hanukkah? When the sages teach that the reason why God allowed the Greeks to desecrate the temple was because the Kohenim were being lazy and so God judged them measure for measure. We learn from this principle, if desiring to be lazy, God the temple destroyed, then what will happen if the Kohanim desired to change their desire to serve God himself? What will happen if they change their negative attitude? God will work a supernatural miracle that would defy the law of both physical and spiritual reality. God could take any flask of oil that was impure and make it pure, take an impure to make it pure. God was able to make a flask of oil that could only last one day and make it available for eight days. And Yeshua said, as Yeshua said, may it be according to your faith. Friends, when you have your head down, In the proverbial ground of life. Doubting your existence. That means that you no longer desire God. And when a person no longer desires God. He has no benefit to anyone. No benefit. He has no value to you. This is why Yeshua tried to reach, teach, reach the Jews of his homeland in Galilee. And they refuse to believe him. What does Matthew say about their unbelief? In Matthew 13, 58. Matthew 13, 58. It says, Yeshua was not able to do any powerful works of faith because of their unbelief. As you want to go, God says, I will help you there. I will walk you to the curb if you want. I will, will drive you if that's where you want to go. So what we learn about Hanukkah, about the Hanukkah story, the flask of oil symbolizes 
the immutable, untainted faith of the Maccabees. Untainted faith. There, there were a few good men left in Israel that believed in the power of miracles. They said, we don't care about the laws of impurity. They said, we want a pure flask of oil. We desire a pure flask of oil. We don't want anything that is impure. We want pure oil. What do you mean, guys? There's no pure oil. I believe in God making the impossible possible. This is very powerful, friends. I also want to point out a very dangerous and scary point to this concept. The Torah teaches or records about the story of Bilam, the false prophet in the book of Numbers. Bilam gets a call from Balak. Please come and put a curse on the Jews and I will pay a large sum of money. What does God say? God says, don't go. But Bilam says, the money looks good, God. I can retire soon. I can take that vacation. What does God say? God says, don't go. What did Bilam do? He goes. And then what, what, what does God say? Let me help you there. You know why? Because you know what your end is. And what is your end? Your end is death. You will die. This teaches us that just because someone is successful, it doesn't mean that they are right. Doesn't mean they are right or doesn't mean that they are correct. Bilam desired to go and it cost him his life. That's why in the beginning I mentioned about trying to merge Hanukkah with the secularization of Christmas. It's like watering down the actual theme of fighting assimilation. It's a danger. Because when people want to make things look successful, it doesn't mean that they are right. It doesn't mean they are right. See, friends, we must remember that at this hour, you're supposed to battle against assimilation. And even when the forces of darkness look like they have you all surrounded, you have to believe in a miracle that God can take the impossible and make it possible. That is his characteristic trait. That's what he is in the business of. He is into miracles. The questions this evening is, do you believe in the miracle of Hanukkah? Forget about the miracle that happened somewhere else. Let's talk about the miracle that can happen in your body this evening. Let's talk about the miracle of the Beit HaMikdash, the holy temple. And now these bodies, Shaul says, are the temple of the, of the Lord. Let's talk about the miracle that can start with you and me. But you and I must have untainted faith like the Hashmonians or the Maccabees. You say, I don't care if it looks impure. I'm looking for impurity. I'm, I'm looking for purity. And one way or the other, I am going to get pure oil. I don't care if this oil only lasts one day. It is going to last me eight days. That's the attitude of Hanukkah. That's the attitude you need to see in when you battle the forces of assimilation. See friends, Messiah shares the story of the parable of the 10 wise virgins. We find that in Matthew chapter 25, where it says five were foolish because they didn't have oil in their flask. Five were wise because they had oil. When Messiah comes, he's looking for those who, who, who can believe in miracles that will be constantly filled with oil. At this season, in this season, you have to ask yourself, what is in your menorah? Are you dry this evening? Are you trying to replace the oil with candlesticks? I'm sorry 
the candlesticks don't have the same effect. It's wax. It, it melts down. Oil evaporates. It's like a sweet fragrance. Ask yourself, what is inside your menorah? Maybe you're dry this evening. Maybe you lack faith in believing in miracles. Maybe you need a fresh touch from Hashem this evening. I pray, remember, Hanukkah is not about presents. Hanukkah is not about latkes. Hanukkah is not about sufgani oil. Nothing. Hanukkah is about fighting the forces of darkness and believing in miracles. Amen. Father, in the name of Yeshua, I pray those of my friends who are watching me from all over the world, if they are in need for a miracle, and if they desire to walk your path no matter what, and if they desire to be like the Maccabees saying, we will not be happy with impure oil, but we want to find pure oil. I pray right now in the name of Yeshua, a miracle would take place upon their homes, upon their lives, upon their situations, upon their bodies. I pray those of them who need healing, I pray right now for supernatural healing to flow through from the top of their head till the tip of their toe. And I pray a miracle would take place, oh God, in the season, oh Father, so that together we can say, by faith, I can do all things. I pray like just like those blind men who cried out to the son of David, this evening, as my friends begin to cry out unto you, I pray for the anointing oil, fresh anointing oil from heaven, from the throne room of God to be poured upon your people wherever they're watching me from and let the name of Yeshua be glorified. We thank you, O oh God. You are able to make everything possible. What seems to be impossible to us is possible with you. If we believe in you. And this evening we choose to believe in you. And this evening we choose to be like the Maccabees. If this evening we choose to follow hard after you. We want to serve you with all of our heart. We want your name to be glorified. In Yeshua's name we pray. Amen and Amen. May the God of Abraham, Isaac and Yaakov bless you and keep you. May you experience a miracle this season. And may this miracle hasten the workings and dealings of Hashem in your life. And may you serve Hashem with all of your heart. And in these days together as the body of Messiah, may we hasten his coming, both Jew and Gentile together. In Yeshua's name, Amen. God bless you, friends. Kag Hanuka Samayak. What an amazing call for action by Pastor Joseph Jones. I hope you all taking the message to heart, talking about call to actions. Just recently, I released a new and exciting book, The Besorah According to the COVID 19. Some people think the book is about the COVID-19 alone. No, it is about you and I in the last days in the call to the greatest action that God has for each and every one of you in the last days. I challenge you now as we today on the seventh night of Hanukkah completed the translation to Spanish to get the book in English or in Spanish, we are shipping all over the world at this point. And I pray that God call you for the right actions, for the right season in these last days. I hope that this seventh night has been a blessing to you, as it's been to us, as always. It is our joy to be here with you. Like, share our broadcast. This is why we're doing it, for you for your families, for the body of Messiah. We will see you tomorrow. It is the eighth night.
חג חנוכה שמח. Please check out this video and spread the light around. חג שמח, everybody.